We have four guests, please. I invite uh, Lars Ebert, Nico Dagenkolb, and Daniela Sani. And I think we have, in a remote, with a remote connection, Adrian Hecklets from JRC. The, the middle topic of this final round table is culture and, uh, and uh, uh, societal change, the European perspective. So we have four histories um, from Lars Hebert from Cultural Action Europe, Nico Dagengob from Goethe Institute, and Daniela Sani for Arter Bologna, and if we'll be with us uh, from Adrian. Yes, yes, Eclex. I'm here. Okay, Adrian, thank you, from JRC. Um, I will be very super quick uh, to introduce uh, these stories with a, a personal stories. Uh, it was more than 11 years ago, and I was in, uh, in a wonderful uh, villa, in a workshop in uh, Villa Simbrione, on a cliff in the coast, in Amalfitan Coastal, uh, in, and I met Pierluigi, and he told me, well, I was finalizing my PhD thesis, trying to understand how uh, to uh, cope with a theoretical framework, a conceptual framework, how to apply a bioeconomic model, uh, the Georgescu Regan, Regan von Flux model on the metabolism of, uh, of city uh, during their uh, cultural regeneration. I'm an applied economics, uh, economist, sorry. Uh, and Pierluigi told me, what about to study the relation <laughs> between culture and waste management? So, so the first <laughs> the first things I thought was, why adding <laughs> another complexity, <laughs> complexity to the <laughs> my complexity? So I had two choices: to take a deep breath and jump from the cl the, the cliff, or <laughs> to take a breath a, bre a deep breath and close myself in a uh, in my study and start to to reflect. In of course, if I'm here, I chose this way. <laughs> that was more complex way, and we start to reflect on. on on, on this relationship and, and, and starting, we realize, uh, uh, we, uh, we summarize uh, uh, in a very brief way, uh, we start reflecting on, 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 on the specificity of, of culture, what culture could, could does that other, other factor could not. Of course, as economists, we, we can say what is culture and what the culture is not but we start to reflect on characteristics of culture that is a symbolic goods, a relational goods, a complex goods, a goods that um, experience a, a cultural participation entails a sort of um, complexity for, a, a, for a, um, an agent. And I, I don't have the time to explain our conceptual framework, but we start reflecting on how culture could be an antecedent or a predictor of proactive behavior that is at the base of, of, the, of a change, a sort of change. So our experience, and we are continuing in, 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 reflecting, in reflecting about that because our conceptual framework is still ongoing, we realize that normal uh, in uh, everyday life we face a lot of bias and a lot of automatic goal that our mental model uh, face. Um, in other uh, domains, these bias are called the frozen behavior. And so we provide the first seminar conceptual framework and the first um, exploratory analysis. Well, we are only at the, the cover of the surface of the of these studies, and we provide some some evidence on the fact that uh, the more you consume culture, the more you participate in a cultural event, the more you will be proactive uh, in, for instance, in recycling, in domestic energy saving, in taking a bus instead of a private car and so on. What I'm trying to say, and that what we understood is that, of course, we can proceed in studying uh, such complex topics by moving from a monodirectional approach. And that's why uh, BAC is the perfect uh, venue for, for us to try to understand the, 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 the behavior, the changing behavior in everyday life is so complex issues that we can we can understand 
or, or measure somehow the indirect impact of culture by moving only, only from an economic standpoint or only from a sociological standpoint and, uh, and so on. So that's the, the end of the story. I have to be <laughs> super quick. So I uh, will introduce uh, the, uh, the panelists. Adrian, sorry. Yes, that's OK. So thanks for having me here. I'm standing in for Katrina Bilincaza, which in a certain sense is quite a pity because she would have had certainly very interesting thoughts after this very packed and very interesting afternoon. Hmm? Um, I have the impression at the beginning of the afternoon I was asking myself, what are we doing here? Uh, but then I remembered that uh, Alessandro had asked to be concrete. And I think that our role is indeed to bring you some messages from the front. Now, the front being uh, the sci -Art project, which started in 2016, and which tries to introduce this hybridization, this real transdisciplinarity into the very scientific, very common, quote unquote, research of my colleagues at the JRC. So for those who don't know, the Joint Research Center is the Science and Knowledge Service of the European Commission. It exists since uh, 1958. It is, was established by the Euratom Treaty. Um, it is operational since the treaty with the Italian state in 1960. And what started first as a nuclear research center quickly became in the 70s and the 80s uh, a research center that specialized in all the science needed to make uh, the, the commission directives and regulation work. So in concrete terms, we do science in support of policy, which of course makes for a lot of harassed and very busy uh, scientists here on site, which I say because it also complicates our work. Now, the previous director general, Vladimir Sucha, uh, strongly wanted the science art project and strongly wanted it as a kind of epistemological experimental playground where we would be looking into the reasons why art and science was surging that much. And if we say it is surging, basically you see in the last at least 50 decades this come and go of interesting collaborations between artists and scientists that's, that can uh, focus on, on, on things like land art in the 70s and on bio art in the 90s and the noughties of this century. Uh, but what you see is that there is a surge of interest from artists into science and from scientists into artists. And that surge is uh, really impressive in the last, in the, these eight years that we are doing this project. And I think your, um, your uh, workshop and your ambitions are quite uh, an indication of this coming together of art and science. But I would also like to put that a little bit in a wider context, in the sense that it is not only that health and art are meeting in these years, it is not only that policymakers are understanding that culture and the arts have an important role to play in society. It is the case that artists have been using scientific instruments and that at least since the 1950s and even beyond, you cannot simply say, and there's always artists interested in conversing with science. What you see the last years is that the artists that we work with are very, uh, very professional in their scientific interests. And you see that that helps them with the access to science that we give them, that is very helpful to make it possible that they co-create works with scientists, our scientists. We do that in the framework of the, uh, the European Commission, of course, the UK, I consider the European Commission as my patron, and we put them together. We have creative collisions, as Ariana Cook, the, the curator who revamped the Art and Science program at CERN uh, mentions it. And we try to make sure that the meetups are uh, fertile and productive. We take a theme from the European Commission. We 
develop a curatorial take on that and a curatorial workshop that combines the arts and sciences. And we invite 20 artists to come over and to converse with our scientists. These are among the best meetings that I've had in my career. They are really electrifying. And what happens in that room is really enthusing. Then afterwards, we hope that the artists and the scientists together conceive a new work of art, and then we produce it. And that is very, very important for the rest of the, uh, of the uh, exercise. Now, now um, when we started, Suka wanted to give the JRC the possibility to find the reasons why art and science was surging so much. But his private objective was to put one artist as an artist into each research project, artist or designer. And I still think that is an excellent idea because from the conversations we had with people like Peter Weibel, who unfortunately passed away on the 1st of March this year, uh, and who was for more than 24 years the CEO of the ZKM in Karlsruhe, which is one of the biggest art science museums in the world, ending always in the top five of the New York Times list of best uh, museums in the world. Peter Weigel, who is one of the theoricians of this movement, uh, has made a strong defense of the fact that our society gives billions of grants to scientists and then leaves the other investigators, the creative investigators, at the mercy of a commercial market of which we know it is basically perverse. And so that is the kind of thing that is happening now. These artists basically want to do the investigations and maybe better than sci art or art sci, we should be talking about the investigative arts. I have heard earlier today these dichotomies between art and science. And of course, the dichotomy between art and science is a historical construct, uh, which there are many reasons for that, uh, them, and I cannot go into that. But we consider this rather as a spectrum of investigation, and it depends on your rather scientific, reproducible uh, way of working, or your rather very personalized, unique interests. No? But where you are on this spectrum, but it is a spectrum. And we see that when we put science and scientists and artists together, there is lots of interest in the way the other works and often discoveries. And indeed, the objectives that we had was a cultural one. The first one is a cultural one. It is to see if art can trigger new research. Our temporary answer is yes, indeed. Um, but also to update, to close the rifts between the two cultures. Now you, you all will know the two cultures of the scientific revolution. The little speech at CP is now given 59 and it created a big fuss in, Anglo in the Anglo-Saxon world. But indeed, the rift is such that both parties are impoverished by it. And we see that both parties want to cover this rift. There is a kind of big historical movement that goes way beyond what an artistic movement is, like Fauvism or Cubism, etc. There is a big coming together of these, uh, of these of artists and scientists because there is a need, because in the age of entanglement, as Mary Oxford has called our times, in the age of entanglement, there is a need of transdisciplinary research. If borders between disciplines are not falling away, for of which we have seen, uh, I think, more than one example today. We had a strategy in 17, in 2016, and I only mention it to remember to tell you that the strategy correctly said that this is not an easy movement because it is culture, because it is about unveiling the culture of the other party and getting to know that. Mm? And that cannot work as a bushfire. It can rather, it can only be an oil spill. It goes slow. It demands that people really commit to the process and uh, are <laughs> willing to follow it. And then we have applied some guidelines. The first guideline is again by Ariane Cook, who, by the way, was one of the experts who has uh, uh, had a, an, an advisory role in this project uh, when she coined the slogan, excellent art for excellent science for CERN. Uh, and that is very important because 
um, if we want to attract good artists, we have to give the artist something, which is the good science. And if we can then bring them to good museums, then they will be interested in working with us. But we also must give them a safe haven, because for an artist, it can be extremely daunting to enter into these temples of research with which they have <coughs> generally not that many uh, knowledge of. When you talk about art and science, then you must make sure that in real life, you give the artist the kind of not protection that he really needs. Um, we are working now on this. I will briefly end this so that you, you can look it up later. We are working on nature archaeology, and that is another evolution. It goes here from art and science into the idea that the arts are taking another role in society, not only with health, but also, for instance, in what we call placement artists, the placement art, in communities, collectivities, where they can enter and treat the dif difficult things that our society has no, no uh, way of presenting as a collectivity. The idea is also that if we don't look into our deep atavistic attitudes to nature, we will never be able to combat global warming. You see here the themes that we have developed, uh, and uh, these are some pictures of the summer school, but this is the important one. And I wanted to point out two uh, projects. One is this lament from Margarita Pevere, which treats solastalgia, the sadness because of the uh, um, dwindling nature. Uh, and it is a project that treats grief and dignity. And the other one is the invisible, these relations are forever by Gemma Woolmore, which tries to develop new modern rituals that can help us to leave the cliches behind, the cliches that have been mentioned today. We will show this in the saint cantonais in Brussels, in Brussels, sorry, um, with an, a setup, a new setup that is called uh, uh, Horizon 5200. Uh, led by Paul Dujardin, the former director of the Bazaar in Brussels. These are the results that we see, but the fourth one is the most impor in, important. That is simply to open up new spaces for discovery for the scientists as well as the artists. And this, I'm afraid, is a work that you cannot standardize. Of course, you can do certain things in health and you can make protocols for that, but the real effects of doing art and science together, you will have only when you accept the uniqueness of the artistic, scientific meetup between the two different parties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> I think that art and science have different languages meet up, but by the way, applied with a common goal of, of telling us how the world is, how the world functions, and, and how the world uh, should be. And it could be, I think, really interesting if the results of this contamination could be exploited in order to achieve a good level of uh, a new form of education about results of these different worlds that try to communicate to obtain, to answer the same questions. By the way, <coughs> I leave the floor to the next panelist, <coughs> hey, Lars. The, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, I'll use the time to quickly say a few words about Culture Action Europe because maybe some of you will surprisingly, thank you, not know the organization. Um, I'm Secretary General of this network uh, of 200 organizations and other cultural networks across Europe, and our main goal is to advocate for the cultural field mainly in Brussels, but also uh, at other institutions. One of our <coughs> main, so, and when we mean advocate, advocate, it's really translating, decoding and encoding. We have one of our most popular newsletters amongst our members is the Brussels Decoder, where we try to decode the bureaucrat's language. Uh, sorry, all the EU people that are here, I know there are some in the program. Uh, <laughs> decode, decode the Brussels language for the cultural field. But uh, we also realized that we have a really important encoding role. So we are encoding the cultural language, which is also a, a, a secret language, so to speak, uh, into policy language. So uh, this is why I just quickly wanted to show you 
a project that we are just finishing where we basically encode uh, findings from a research uh, into policy recommendations. Now we've spoken about that aspect at length in the morning so, uh, or in the previous session, so I'm going to race through that PowerPoint to make a few points in reaction to Adrian, which really, really triggered me. Um, so preparatory action funded by the EU uh, about uh, culture and well-being in the EU, you see it just ends now in June 2023, so uh, you, you get the outcomes fresh from press. Um, I mean, this is the background, health, mental health crisis. These figures are from before the pandemic, so uh, the suicide rates, uh, rate amongst youngsters, uh, the loneliness uh, amongst elderly people, uh, changing work patterns, and so on. Horrible figures, even higher now, a few, uh, a, a pandemic down the road. Um, in a nutshell, the project collected 210 scientific studies. Um, I'm really um, happy that Niels Fiti is here and already presented. He was part of our um, scientific advisory board. In, in a way, building up on the WHO report from, of uh, 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 2019. Um, so the report is out. It's a, it's, a, it's a thick book. Luckily, there is a summary which I've got with me, and uh, I would recommend you to take the short version. Um, there's a, a map online of uh, 800 and more projects um, across Europe that uh, work with culture in health uh, and well-being environments. The project has run six edi additional um, case studies and has done a lot of conferencing and networking and so on. Um, WHO report you know, the other ones are the main outcomes. The third one, the gray one, is a compendium that we've just published last week, uh, which is a sort of do's and don'ts for cultural institutions to engage in, 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 in health and well-being settings. I told you I'll race through it. Uh, the, the main findings are divided in these four categories, um, prevention and promotion, management and treatment, I think all these areas have been have been mentioned before, so um, I mean I want to save time now to make a few points. <laughs> these are these are uh, pilot projects that we've been running, and they uh, for me show um, a problem. Um, I started. I can talk with a little bit of critical distance because I've started my job only in January, so I'm. I'm observing the project as a, with, a, with a distance. I've not been involved in it. And I think these six projects show um, a problem that I've already heard uh, in the discussion this morning, that there are a lot of blurry lines between areas. Which kind of art are we actually talking about? Where's the line between art therapy? Where's the line between participatory art, community art, socially engaged art, um, hardcore l'art pour l'art? I mean, all of them are in a way mixed together. So in these 300 plus projects that we've, six, uh, 800 plus projects, you will find all of them. And in these case studies, um, I would say even in these case studies, the lines are blurred. Um, these eight challenges are quite rightly um, pinpointed by the project, uh, project. The need for an increased focus on health promotion and prevention, uh, growing mental health crisis needs attention, the need to support broader health and well-being of young people, ongoing changes to the lab labor markets, patterns of work and the economy, an aging population, we've heard that uh, already in a, in a presentation before, the association between ill health and patterns of inequality, promoting active citizenship, and difficulties faced by forcibly displaced people in the EU. Uh, so this is where it comes down to. These are our policy uh, recommendations. Um, first of all, dedicated strategic and financial support. Um, I, I'm really happy that one of, the, uh, one of the impacts, I dare to say, that this project already had is the uh, comprehensive approach uh, to mental health that was uh, launched last week, where culture is mentioned seven times, uh, mental health has a, um, has, a, has a strong focus, especially in uh, social, social prescribing that it focuses on. But also, um, we just had uh, Vice President Skinas with us uh, the day before at our annual conference in LFCNA, 
talking about the comprehensive approach uh, and especially um, launching an OMC, an expert group of the member states that will, will look into it in the next years. I think that can pave the way to really get into an ongoing conversation and, and change, um, change policies across the EU. Um, knowledge and awareness building will be covered through that, but much more is needed. And then we come to training and peer learning. And something that, that strikes me um, when I look at that project, but also when I listen to the, to the conversations earlier today, um, is that we've done, I've, before I started this job, I've worked for 20 years in higher arts education. And we've worked extremely hard to, um, to tune in all kinds of, of, of higher arts education fields in, in, in the EU into competency profiles. There are profiles of artists for all art disciplines, and not only visual art, dance, and so on, but uh, also socially engaged arts with spe specialization in, in, in health. And, and we've described that on BA, MA, PhD level, uh, and now, um, there are these initiatives where corporations take place and, and these different frameworks are totally not tuned in. So um, if, we, if, we, if we look at how to col collaborate further and break through silos and develop new programs or work with the existing programs that train our artists and our social workers and therapists, those are two different fields, then we can look where the complementaries are. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. These profiles are there. And now the question for me would be, what do we need? Do we need integrated qualification frameworks? Do we need to um, put these competencies next to each other and identify gaps? I would say and predict, uh, it's a, I mean, shot in the dark, but my prediction would be if we put them next to each other, we won't find many gaps. There are complementarities. And, and the work has already been done. Um, I'll get back to something else later. Okay, um, those are the recommendations. I'll, I'll keep it to that for, for the moment and refer you to the website and would like to get back to um, maybe uh, two more points that um, were triggered in my thinking by the presentation of Adrian. Uh, I think in the same way we could look at the qualification frameworks when we think about training for artists that can collaborate with health workers. Uh, we can do the same when it comes to research. Um, the, the artistic field has developed extremely um, transparent qualification frameworks for PhD, on PhD level. There's a lot of work being done uh, on the level of artistic research and when I see how we talk about um, collaboration between scientists and artists in research fields. Uh, the artists are the reacting party. And um, that Adrian has described it in a, in a very nice way, but we also see it in the horizon calls. Um, artistic research centers cannot apply for, for a horizon. We can, we can participate, but we participate on the terms of the universities and of the other science, science. and we are, we are the critical feedback. We are kind of the disruptors, the visionaries, the creatives, but we are not the ones that set the agenda. And there are research methods. There's a whole catalog of research methodologies in the arts, uh, and it would be worthwhile sitting together and looking really seriously how we can uh, tune in funding programs that we are on a level playing field. Um, one more concern, policy related. Um, we may be aware that Maria Gabriel um, has left for Bulgaria, uh, which means at the moment that the cul our cultural portfolio has been taken care of by Vice President Skinas, and the health portfolio, for instance, is being taken care of by Vice President Verstager. My, my concern is that in the next commission next year, these portfolios may be May, may be separated again as they were in the past. We've been fighting hard to, letting, to keep them together, to bring them together. And if we take art as a, as a knowledge production, as serious knowledge production area, as seriously as the others, we should be very loud and outspoken um, to make sure that these portfolios stay together. Thank you, thank you, Lars, for putting the spotlight on the growing evidence of the positive 
<coughs> externalities of culture and our health and well-being in general. I, I think that the big issues is, is the real issues is to set up a dedicated strategic uh, and, uh, and policy support and trying to to un to to reason in terms of cultural protocol that that is cross-cutting several policy imperatives, and and so we have to reason not in uh, separate ways but in conjoint ways. By the way. Um, I leave the floor to Daniela Sani from Arthur. So, thank you very much for inviting me. I will try to be short and effective as much as possible, and I would like to start with a video. Uh, the, what I'm going to present is, um, is the AT Culture and Creativity, is, is a new kick uh, from the European Institute for Innovation and Technology. And in particular, I would like to focus on the co-location center south that will be located here in, uh, in Italy, in particular in Bologna, that is going to provide uh, some services and some support to many of the needs of uh, researchers, scientific evidence that you have presented today. And, um, this will provide you some finance and will provide you also some rooms where to allocate all the what you have presented so far. Okay, you can launch the video, please. Today, like never before, humankind is facing unforeseen challenges. Reality demands new solutions and it takes new thinking to find them. We believe the front door to innovation is diversity. When diverse perspectives meet, new ideas come to life as solutions that will define the future vision of Europe. That's why we are here, to empower the next generation of innovators, to speed up creativity by supporting creative minds and connecting them with businesses, universities, investors, researchers, leaders, and the general society in radically new ways. Creativity is the connecting tissue across borders. Collaboration is the blood flowing through it. And we are the heart pumping. Thriving within Europe, ideas that move the world forward. Creatives without borders. Innovation without limits. Okay, that was the video, um, and in the video, I will present the, the, this kick, this new concept in the, in the in the kicks, and and the, one of the points that the video uh, point out very well, in my opinion, is the inclusivity and the diversity. So uh, this is why in in a kick like the AT culture and creativity, all the concepts that we talk today can find and house can find room can find also findings um, they, um, about the collocation center uh, there are uh, some um, local distribution geographical distribution of the kicks and yeah that's our collocation center there are some subsidiaries that are dislocated around the Europe there are in total six we have one in Italy, as I said, uh, located in Bologna, but many others are in Kosice, Helsinki, Amsterdam, and many others can be built in next future. What they are going to provide the co-location center, they facilitate the cooperation for and across the regions. They become the physical model uh, nodes for, for deploy the ecosystem, deploy the, the research and the activities of the, uh, of the kick address and serve, um, build the local networks, engage on boards, um, the stakeholders, and also uh, um, cooperate and coordinate the activities across the, uh, across the Europe. The, um, about the, uh, the node in Italy, the one of Bologna, that will be spin off by Harter. Harter is, uh, I, I came from Harter. Arthur is a regional agency for uh, attractiveness, uh, uh, innovation, technology transfer, and we are the service of the region to deploy not only uh, innovation but also uh, te uh, technology transfer and attractiveness for the territory. We coordinate a quite complicated network of innovation. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, we coordinate many uh, local activities and we put this experience in, in, the, in the development of this uh, new kick and also in uh, managing the, uh, the new co-location center. Uh, we have experience also in other kicks, such as, for example, the climate, the raw material, and the manufacturing, and that will help also in create a cross interrelation between the different uh, the different kicks. Um, where we be located in the the colocation center, we be located at the Bologna Technopoles. And uh, up to now, the Bologna Technopoles is recognized at the European International uh, level as a data valley because we are um, hosting uh, the, um, the new uh, supercomputer, uh, high-performance computers named Leonardo, with high capacity of data and high capacity of elaboration of data. So that is an example of how the culture and creative can be matched with uh, technology, also when we talk about the deep technology such as the data. And I think also in many of your uh, researches or many of your needs that you have presented today is need this kind of analysis. And this is why this, uh, we, can, we can put together also in, in this place the, the scientific part, the data part with the culture and, and creativity. But the, um, the coverage, the geographical coverage of the co-location center will be not only in Italy, will be transnationals. We will have an impact on, on the Mediterranean area. In particular, we are going to engage uh, Cyprus, uh, Greece, Montenegro, Israel, and many others that are knocking to our doors because they want to enter in the community, they want to enter in this, in this system. The, um, which are the key points, the key, uh, the key um, keywords uh, for, of our communication center, but also uh, this can be shared also in the entire AT uh, culture and creativity community. First of all, the finance finance for innovation, that means also finance the social innovation and impact the economy. Today we spoke a lot about the social innovation, but also the impact in the social cohesion, in the health. So that is um, this kind of keywords can find, uh, can find a, a, a possibility to be financed in, in, the, in, this, uh, in this system. But we are talking also about artificial intelligence, the big data, smart cultural heritage. We, we, we heard how the smart and cultural heritage deal with the, with the climate change. And so we need, for example, the artificial intelligence in order to match this kind of information. And also education. We know that there's no innovation without education, but also we know that uh, how is important the education, especially in the culture and creativities, uh, and we, we mentioned many, many times today. Um, we, uh, when we spoke about education, we spoke about higher high level education, so first of all, master and PhD, but also vocational training in order to take into consideration all the value chain of the education as well as the lifelong learning part. Talent attraction, we have to attract the talent, we have to attract artists, for example, in order to support the the, the interconnection in the different disciplines that we have so that are part of the DNA of the AT culture and creativities. And finally, but we have as we have to deal also with the market, even though we don't have to be necessarily market oriented, but we have to deal with the market, we have to deal with the competitiveness and the innovation. We have to also talk about startup acceleration investment and internationalization because there's no possibility to uh, of the idea to survive if they don't find also uh, market opportunities looking about uh, the 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 strategic agenda for next two years so we are talking about the strategic agenda of 2024 to 2027 uh, you see here the focus of the of the future uh, years in which we are going to have all the, uh, the, the different opportunities that I mentioned before, such, for example, the fashion, so reinvent the fashion in a more sustainable and circular way. 
renovate buildings, public space, and urban architecture. And we saw and we heard today how the environmental, the living space where we live, are so important in in the in the well-being of the person. Um, we want also to renovate the the audiovisual markets and uh, deal with the sustainability criteria, and finally also to reposition the cultural heritage in a more economic role and social and social cohesion. As you see, there are many keywords that are part of the payoff of this PAC conference. Uh, last, this is my last uh, slides. So uh, what can be uh, also uh, very close to us is uh, the 27 of October, the date is not there, but I can tell you the 27 of October, we will have the Cultural and Creative Days in Bologna. Uh, what we are going to do in these days of uh, culture dedicated to culture and creative, we are going to um, connect uh, uh, ideas, to do some practice, to present also some opportunity of the kicks. Uh, we are also um, cooperating, co-branding with uh, with others in, in realizing these uh, CC days. These are the first CC days that we are uh, deploying. Um, the, the CC days will be deployed uh, all across the Europe, so in all the different six co-location center, uh, more or less in the same dates. So probably there will be a slight difference in one or two days, but the, the period is the final week of October. So I hope that you participate to these CC days, and I hope to welcome in, in Bologna. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Daniela, for uh, <coughs> showing us how vibrant uh, is uh, Bologna and the Emilia Romagna region are. And I think, of course, that high capacity of data could be an opportunity to go deeper in measuring the impact of culture, for instance, for instance in, the, in the innovation. Um, I believe that the focus should not be restricted in uh, CCIs, but also in the world economy, in the world industries. Try to understand the role of culture in, in, in industries, in innovation process of industries that apparently have nothing to do with culture. I'm a little bit spoiling a project that we are going to do here in, uh, in Pescara. By the way, I leave the floor uh, to uh, our <coughs> final convener. There is Nico. Yeah, hi. As far as I am informed, our bus back to the beach left one minute ago, so I keep myself very short. I'm also um, in the interim management team of the EIT Culture and Creativity, together with Pierluigi and uh, Daniela working on it. I'm working on a program called Value Impactor, which is um, a very unique thing for EIT and KICS as it's for the first time addressing societal objectives, social uh, objectives. And value impact is all about uh, values, uh, also European values. Uh, this is our European perspective here. Uh, these are uh, the fundamental values of the European Union, as you know, human dignity, democracy, equality, freedom, rule of law, human rights, intangible cultural heritage. Uh, mentioned today also where it's uh, coming from. The challenges today were also mentioned. Um, I don't have to repeat them, but I, I do quickly. Climate change, demographics, mental health crisis, migration, inequality, late capitalism, artificial intelligence. You all heard about the, the, uh, the report coming out last week saying that AI is threatening our existence, undersigned by Sam Altman and other really leaders of that, so that's a big challenge. Uh, we have to talk, was not so much addressed today, but maybe tomorrow, and of course, other authoritarian tendencies all over Europe. So what can culture do? And uh, today I was also wondering about a little typology, because uh, we mentioned culture a lot, but we, are mean, we still mean different things, right? The broadest aspect of culture is what uh, probably Max Weber, to quote another German sociologist, means by culture, basically paraphrasing him, uh, everything human beings contribute or attribute meaning to. So this is the broad definition of culture that cultural studies is uh, 
is propagating since the 1960s. We could say everything is culture, and uh, in a way it is, and we could say to tackle these topics, we just have to increase the meaning, right? If people care about nature, they will care about the planet. If they care about family, they will care about the elderly. This is a matter of education, of course. So this is the broad definition of culture. Then to take, very new to me, uh, culture as a medical tool. Uh, thank you, I'm too close. Culture as a medical tool, I don't have to repeat that, was dealt with extensively. But also you could say as a motivational tool. Just one example, use games, right? Games, what do they do? They motivate people by giving them a sense of autonomy, a sense of uh, social feedback, a sense of competence, easy to learn how to master. This is why we like games. And we had some gamification topics today and examples in the, in the app from, from you, for example. But also I had to think about the mice, you know, that was basically gamification. Uh, we could use culture to, to solve uh, these challenges by having cultural uh, practices such as gamification and light. And then very, very difficult topic, the artistic practice. Uh, we can talk about that uh, longer, but it's really controversial to me. There's, there's Martin mentioned it, there's uh, the problem of the artist feeling instrumentalized when you say, okay, I, I want an artist and we commission them with an art to make people feel better on their mental uh, basis. I think some artists have issues with that. And um, I quote Jeff Mulgan here, who wrote this in a, in a Cambridge element earlier this, this year. And he says, if you commission an artist to solve a social problem, you will neither solve the problem nor will you have good art. So art should be at a way at attention, he says. He's an, uh, artists are prophets at attention who don't address the social challenge or the, the mental health, the health issue directly, but they reflect on it. They, uh, they, they, they create something with it. And I think this is what all the, the projects we heard by Andrea and also by, by Lars, uh, it's a sense how they deal with that. So um, that's something that we should uh, bear in mind. Of course, art, artistic practice can be very helpful. We all know about musical therapy. I don't know if you saw the movie uh, Life Inside. It's very touching. It's about uh, people that have dementia and that uh, are, are, are really not cured, but uh, feeling much better if they hear music in from their youth. So this was really it's artistic practice leading to mental health. But of course, let's twist again or Kessera. Sarah was not written for that. It's better, I'm too close, I don't hear myself. So yeah, we have to think about that and measurement is very tricky here because uh, if we really take art seriously, we cannot have this art as a uh, KPI and, and the, the immediate output, but we have to talk about the contribution uh, gap and we have to talk about uh, uh, the unintended impact that art might have. And uh, then the last layer, I, we talked a lot about this art as a culture, as a social practice, meaning cultural participation. And uh, Pierre Luigi has, has done research on that. The higher the social and uh, the cultural participation in a, in a country, in a, in a sphere, the better the cultural innovation is. We have to increase that. Also for equality reasons, 10% that go to uh, culturally funded organizations, publicly funded cultural organizations, it's numbers for Germany is not enough. We have to work on that and, and co-creation and, and, and community practices and work like such as you do and the kick wants to do is the way to go. So to sum up with the, with the European values as a, as a compass, we should facilitate culture um, capacity and the capacity of culture to generate meaning and also as artistic and social practice in, in all the fields with a societal relevance. And yeah, coming from a cultural organization, of course, saying that we should art have the liberty it needs to, to do exactly. And, and this is what exactly the AIT culture and creativity has set out to do. So thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Nico. Of course, me measuring, as you, as you said, measuring uh, art and culture contribution is a, is a complex issue. Um, but I think that if we are here, we just achieved our first results, that, I that <coughs> is to go beyond the pure uh, measuring the impact of uh, GDP in terms of a uh, number of employees. And so try to understand how culture could be the different in measuring the indirect impact. <laughs>